Megachurch pastor J.D. Greer is back in the news again, and I'm afraid it's not for a very good reason. Stay tuned. Well, welcome back to another week of Explain, another week where we engage the culture from a biblical perspective in a manner which glorifies God. And uh, this week we're going to be uh, talking uh, specifically about J.D. Greer and also uh, just how we as Christians can live in light of the Word of God and not be uh, carried away uh, by some of the arguments that someone like J.D. Greer would make. Um, so let me, uh, let me give you a little bit of context for what is going on. So as you know, um, if you've been with us for more than just this week, you know that uh, Megan Basham's book, Shepherds for Sale, uh, came out uh, last week. And uh, it, uh, it, it, of course, uh, uncovered and, and reminded us in some other cases of a lot of uh, things that uh, seem to be amiss in the, uh, in the church um, especially with some of the more well-known pastors that are in the church. Um, one of those, uh, one of those uh, pastors that was mentioned a lot um, was J.D. Greer. And I started to notice, you know, as people started to talk about this book, um, that there was something that was being uh, exposed. Um, a lot of times um, there, there have been people who preach uh, from a pulpit um, or who teach um, in a lecturing hall or who write books that Christians read, who will say things, um, and it's very easy to get uh, carried away with just agreeing with those people without really knowing what they're saying. Um, or alternatively, um, Christians have, uh, have, have lost, a lot of times, a lot of Christians um, have lost the will to push back on these types of things because they know they're just going to get canceled as a, as a homophobe or a racist or a bigot or some other type of thing. Um, it does cost Christians a lot of times these days in the culture that we live in, in the political climate in which we live, to be a Christian and to be outspoken about your faith and to have a biblical worldview. Um, and so for all those reasons, uh, I think a lot of Christians sometimes find it easier to just roll with what Big Eva, for lack of a better uh, term, is saying. Um, and so when guys like Russell Moore um, say that uh, say that you should vote for Kamala Harris or something, or um, um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying that that's what he said, but he did his his magazine did put out something that was um, that was favorable towards Kamala Harris um, last week. Um, actually, I think that was actually this week. Um, but when something comes out from Christianity Today that's favorable towards Kamala Harris or when uh, David French tells you in very veiled language that he's voting for Kamala Harris like he uh, seems to have just done. Um, just over the last uh, 48 hours, I would say. Um, when people say this, a lot of times um, that sends a message to the normal, regular um, Christian that works a nine-to-five job and works Monday through Friday, you know, and just uh, is trying to live a life that pleases God. A lot of times that signals to a Christian like you or like me that we can't lift up our head. You know, we can't say anything against what the party line is. So, like, let's say that um, that a Christian uh, reads that article. Well, a lot of Christians have found it easy to just say, well, Russell Moore says, uh, or, or rather, I'm sorry, David French says that uh, that it's probably a good idea to vote for Kamala Harris, so that's what I'm going to do. Or, at the very least, I'm not going to tell anybody that I'm voting for Trump, right? You know, that, and that's, that's, thing, that's the type of thing that a lot of Christians uh, will do. Um, and it can be very easy to fall into that trap. So I want to sympathize with you. I understand that it's easy to fall into that trap, but here's what I am here to do today. I am here to tell you that when the J.D. Greers of the world and the Russell Moores of the world and the David Frenches of the world and the Curtis Changs of the world um, 
and, and, and all these other people uh, try to encourage you to compromise on what you know the Bible says as a Christian, as a follower of God, brother, sister, we have to stand up and stand on his word and say, no, no. And uh, today we are going to talk about how not to be a passive Christian, how to not be passive. And the first thing that I want to do, just to kind of set the stage, we already talked about Shepherds for Sale um, a little bit here at the beginning. Uh, we did a whole episode on Shepherds for Sale last week. If you are interested um, in, in learning more about that, please feel free to go check that out. So one, one thing that I noticed about that book um, and this this episode is not really going to be about that book, but I think it is necessary kind of to set the context for what's going on. So the one thing that I had mentioned, and I just, uh, we, we posted it here on our account um, on X. Uh, we said this, here's the thing about the Shepherds for Sale book. The book has undoubtedly exposed the divide in evangelicalism that, if we're being honest, many of us already knew were there. We saw it, but we couldn't put a finger on what it was, why it was there, or where it was headed. Uh, Megan Basham has done us a favor by precisely putting a finger on it with data to back up every claim. Um, and if you look at the footnotes section of that book, it is extensive. Um, one of the main presenting issues I remember noticing when I started being confused at what was going on in evangelicalism, now this is just my own experience here, um, was the fact that so many people suddenly stopped being clear on what the Bible taught. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to nuance everything, even on issues where... Uh, they did take a clear stand, they'd follow it up or proceed it by saying something equally as confusing and unclear. Uh, so one example of that would be, um, I, I want to jump over really quick. Um, I want to jump over really quick to this thread here by Neil Shenvey. Um, Neil Shenvey has, um, I, I guess for lack of a better term, he's taken issue with uh, this book. Um, and uh, I think specifically because his pastor is J.D. Greer, so he's taken issue with it because it heavily features J.D. Greer. Um, and, and the problem is J.D. Greer does say a lot of things that uh, whether they're designed or not to lead Christians astray, they lead Christians astray. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I, I remember uh, Neil Shenvey said something um, at, at one point. He said something like, well, the meaning of... Um, the meaning of what someone says isn't determined by the hearer. It's determined by uh, the person who said it. And while I understand where he's getting that, he's obviously getting that from the way that we exegete the scriptures, right? Of course, the scriptures can never mean what they never meant. Of course, the scriptures meant what they meant uh, when the original writer wrote them, okay? So that's where he's getting that from. But that's 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 not really the case uh, when you're talking about preaching, right? As a pastor, um, of course, we want to uh, be charitable to people and understand that they may have had a different meaning with what they said, but that doesn't excuse the fact that if, if so many people can take the things that you say and go a certain direction with it that leads them astray, then you really need to be careful about what you say. And if you're continuing to say things like that, that are continuing to lead people astray, well, then what do you think people are going to think, right? So as a pastor, um, the, 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 the objection that people give sometimes uh, that, no, it's not uh, what the pastor meant that matters, or, or, or rather it is what the pastor meant that matters, and that's the only thing that matters. Well, I, I understand where they're getting that, but the pastor needs to take into account more than that. They need to take into account how is the audience, how is a normal person going to receive what I'm saying? And if every normal person is receiving what he's saying in a different way than the way that he intended it, uh, intended for it to be taken, uh, then that means that either he's not a great communicator or that he actually meant for the congregation to take it in that way. Okay. And that's really, that's, that's just, that's just pure logic, right? That's how we arrive at a conclusion like that. Um, but anyway, I got off topic there. Let's, let's look at, um, some of these things that Neil Shenvey had brought up. Okay. Um, let's just, Look at what Neil says here. I just finished the introduction of Megan Basham Shepherd Shepherds for Sale. My review will focus more on broader themes than on factual issues, but I spot check some of the endnotes for material I recognized. I'll post the results below without commentary. 
so he see he's saying this that he's posting below without commentary and my initial comment to that um, when I responded to it was okay let's take him at his word let's just look at the results below without commentary now I did say a few minutes ago that Shenvi has taken issue with Basham's book because since then he has posted other things that definitely took issue with uh, with Basham's book so uh, just want to clear that up so on the top you see Basham's book Knowing that they don't have the backing of their claimed constituencies, these evangelical leaders turn their pulpits and platforms into vehicles for shaming the rake and file because they will not agree that supporting, say, the Black Lives Matter movement is a gospel issue necessary to show uh, the world what it means to be a faithful follower of Christ. Okay. And then this is... Um, this, is the, uh, this, is, this is the quote here. This is Greer's quote. Southern Baptists, we need to say it clearly as a gospel issue. Black lives matter, Greer said. Of course black lives matter. Our black brothers and sisters are made in the image of God. Black lives matter because Jesus died for them. I realize that the movement and the website has been hijacked by some political operatives whose worldview and policy prescriptions would be deeply at odds with my own. But that doesn't mean the sentiment behind it is untrue, Greer added. I do not align myself with the Black Lives Matter organization, and I think saying bold things like to fund the police is unhelpful and deeply disrespectful to many public servants who bravely put themselves in harm's way every day to protect us. So I think um, what Shenvi is doing here is he's trying to show that Basham took Greer out of context. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. One thing that you'll find happens a lot, and this is what I'm, I'm just going over here to illustrate what I was saying um, on, on the, the post that, that we made on this issue, uh, that people are unclear, pastors are unclear when they say things unequivocally like black lives matter. Uh, but then in the next breath, they basically say uh, that I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't agree with the movement or whatever. So you're confusing the you're confusing your congregants when you say that because somehow a great amount of 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 people who listened to Greer decided that Black Lives Matter and they went completely woke and liberal and leftist. Okay, so if he's saying that, um, if he's saying that and it's leading that amount of people in the wrong direction. Um, then, like I said, we have to conclude that either he's not communicating what he means well, or he's actually meaning uh, what Basham is saying that he's meaning. Um, and in this case, Basham actually said afterwards um, that, that Greer has said so many things that would, uh, that would basically make um, a, a conservative reading um, or a, 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 I guess a, a right-leaning, conservative-leaning reading of Greer's comments here impossible. Um, Basham said, uh, J.D. Greer promoted pronoun hospitality. J.D. Greer said the Bible whispers about sexual sin. J.D. Greer encouraged Christians to adopt the slogan of Black Lives Matter. J.D. Greer enacted a DEI standard for committee appointments, promising that they would be 30% women or minorities. And that's just a start. Um, and then she says, if Neil Shenvey wants to pretend that this context does not inform how J.D. Greer's words are received, that's up to him. I'm not going to play stupid. Um, and so basically what, what Basham is doing is pointing to the greater context of Greer's comments, um, an even greater context than what Shenvey was willing to point out. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that oftentimes you'll have pastors who will say things um, in a way where it is, it, it is sometimes um, a trap for Christians to, you know, the rank and file Christian like you and me is very easy for us to jump in that trap without really knowing what we're doing. Um, but the way to hit now, now here's the thing. I'm, I'm going to start to point out some other things about what he has said. Um, and, and then we'll get to the point of not being passive. Okay. Um, so there's this post here by William Wolf. Um, he's just reposting a video uh, that, that I think initially it looks like it was posted by Abolitionists Rising. Um, William Wolf is posting a video of J.D. Greer. Um, you're going to find it in the link in the description of this video so you can go watch the video in full. Um, Greer, uh, quote, uh, Wolf quotes Greer rather as saying, We have people in our church who work in some of these abortion clinics. Okay. Um, and so what Wolf is basically pointing out is uh, is that Greer is pandering to people who work in, in an abortion clinic, right? Um, and then there's there has been this great outpouring of of people arguing back and forth about 
um, you know, were there pro-choice people um, who attended Greer's church or were there not? Um, and needless to say, there were. Now there are some people arguing that, uh, oh well, you know, um, they're, the, you know, they had to give up being pro-choice in order to be admitted into membership or, or something like that. But here's the thing: if there are pro-choice people that feel comfortable attending a church week after week after week after week, whether they're a member or not, um, and and they're not hearing that that position is wrong. Then, then I'm sorry, that's wrong, okay? You, you need, you need to, we need to be clear on what the Bible teaches, okay? We know um, Exodus 20 says, do not murder, okay? And if we as Christians don't have uh, the reasoning abilities and, um, and uh, the, the, the mental capacity uh, to understand that the child in the womb from the point of conception is a life that if you took it would be considered murder, uh, then any, any Christian who, who can't stand for that, who can't stand boldly upon that claim, um, should not be in ministry, okay? Should not be in ministry. And I will, I will say that um, without apology. Um, we need Christians who, in ministry who stand up for the people who can't speak, who speak up for those who have no voice, right? We understand that. That's what the scriptures say. Okay, but here's the thing, okay? And this is where I kind of want to shift it to, to you and me, okay? The rank-and-file Christian, okay? We ha- the reality of the situation is we have pastors like J.D. Greer who inhabit the world around us, okay? We have uh, Christian leaders like Russell Moore, okay? Like David French. They shouldn't be Christian leaders. You shouldn't be listening to them, okay? But the fact that they exist means that there will be people around us who listen to them, okay? And so the question then becomes, how do we respond? And it's, it's easy to respond passively. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, I've been thinking about this, this verse. Uh, you know, the verse in 1 John where it says, do not love the world. Do not love the world. Okay, and this is this is very, very important to what we're tracking at here because we think about being passive, right? A lot of times people will talk about someone as being a passive Christian. But here's the thing. No person is passive about literally everything in their life. And why is that? Well, it's because passion, which I guess I would juxtapose to passivity, um, or, or intentionality might be a better way to put that. Let's, let's say that. So in, intentionality and passivity really flow out of your love, your love, okay? So if you love God and you love his word, you're going to be intentional about following God and following his word and pursuing God and getting to know God better, okay? Um, but there are ways to be intentional about other things as well. Okay, there are ways to be intentional about your job. Okay, so if you love your job more than anything else in your whole entire life, then you're going to be not passive there, I guarantee it. You're going to be intentional about what you're doing. You're going to pursue that with a vengeance. And this is really one thing that really kind of sparked my my thinking here uh, about this is a sermon by a pastor named Tim Conway, and he does not get enough recognition for what he's up to. He's a wonderful, wonderful pastor. Um and he had said something um, a, a few weeks ago about how he, um, when he came to Christ, he said the way that he put it was he wanted to pursue Christ and follow Christ with a vengeance, okay? And we understand that vengeance can be used in a, in a bad way sometime. That's not the way that he was using it. I totally understand what he was saying, and that's, my, that's the cry of my heart. Like, I want to follow Christ and, and submit to him. Um, and, and do what he says, and, and love him, and get to know him more with a vengeance, right? And with a vengeance means you're not being passive. You're, 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 you're going after it. You're being intentional about it, and there is no way that you are passive about literally everything in your life, okay? Because passivity flows out of your love. So here's the thing, okay? The Bible tells us do not love the world, okay? Okay? So if you're passive, Okay, if you're passive about uh, following the Lord, following his word, okay, 
then that might mean that your love is not rightly ordered. It's not in the right place. If you have, if every issue that comes to you seems like it's catching you on your heels, like let's say, um, let's say, what does the Bible have to say about abortion? Okay, could you, could you, could you actually make a case from the scriptures about what the Bible has to say about abortion? If you're feeling like you're back on your heels right now, then you might need to, uh, you might need to think about uh, how much do I love the Word of God? How much do I love what the Word of God has to say about everything? How much do I, uh, d does my worldview flow from the Word of God? Okay, if I ask you right now, what is it? What is the biblical uh, stance on the LGBTQ issue? Okay, if you're feeling back on your heels right now about this, then that means that you might need to think about where is my uh, love. Where is my, do I love maybe something else a little more than I should? And do I not love the word of God as much as I should? And one way to tell what you love is where do you invest your time? Hey, where does your time go? Where does your mind wander to? When you're, when, when you have free time, is it going to chasing after the Lord or doing what he says? That's another thing, right? Uh, there are many people who are very, very busy. Okay, but they're busy in a good way. They're busy in their ministry. They're busy in serving God. They're busy in, uh, in saving the unborn, right? You see people standing outside of abortion clinics all the time. Abolitionist Rising would be a good example of that, right? Um, but but it's, it's, it's how do you spend your time is a good way to see um, where is your love. So if a guy like J.D. Greer can come in and say something like, hey, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, women who, who work um, in abortion clinics who attend this church and suddenly you're back on your heels like, Hmm, I don't know. What does the Bible have to say about that? Well, and you gotta be ready for these things when they come. Okay. We have to be ready for these things when they come to us. All right. And that's why, that's why the Bible is clear when it says, love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Because out of our love for God flows a love for his word. Okay, and uh, that causes us to be intentional about following him and to not be passive and to not have situations like uh, like, you know, a J.D. Greer pastor preaching in front of you. And then you don't know, hmm, OK, is this right or is this wrong? Like we should we should I want I pray that Christians, the rank and file Christians, I pray to God that this would happen, that the rank and file Christians would be able to see someone like J.D. Greer say something as bad as that um, and be able to point it out and say, in unison, that's wrong. That's wrong. And if you're going to continue to say things like that, then don't be in the pulpit. Okay? Uh, that, that's, that's where I pray that Christians can get to. And I know, look, I know it's hard. I know you got a job. I know you got a life. I know you probably got a family and things like that, right? And, and those things, here, here's the other thing. Those things are not uh, bad. They're not bad. Those are not those are not bad things to have. As a matter of fact, um, a wife, a family, a job, um, a ministry, those are all blessings from the Lord. OK. And if we love the Lord the most, if we chase after him and and we and we love him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and our love for those other things, those good things that he's given us will be rightly ordered. OK. And so when we talk about uh, being, being passive, a lot of times uh, we're passive in our walk with God, in our understanding of God's word, uh, because um, our love is placed upon something or is, 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 is funneled towards something that God has given us that is a good thing, um, but we love it more than we love him. And, and, and we, spend, uh, we spend more time thinking about that and dwelling on it than we do spending time in God's Word and thinking about God's Word and communing with God in prayer. Right? And this is, the, this is the place that we need to get to. We need to be able to, uh, as Christians, we need to be able to, to understand uh, and, and point out when things are wrong. 
Okay, we want to not be on our heels so that when the when when the J.D. Greer gets in the pulpit or the Russell Moore uh, types out something um, on his on his magazine in his magazine or whatever, or when David French takes out that Sunday morning uh, editorial thing that he always does. Um, when those things happen, we don't want to be back on our heels. And the way to not be back on our heels is to know what the word of God has to say about it. J.D. Greer says the Bible whispers about homosexuality, okay? Um, the Bible says something completely different. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit, will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, so this is very clear that no homosexuality is not a good thing. LGBTQ is not a good thing. If you see it in the life of a professing Christian, can't be tolerated. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. So J.D. Greer says the Bible whispers about homosexuality, uh, about, about the LGBTQ stuff. But now, hopefully, you have an answer to that. And you're not back on your heels when he says something like that. And you can say, wait, no, that's wrong. Okay, and that's where we need to get. That's where I hope that we can get as Christians. And man, I'm still trying to get there. I'd be lying. Like I just, I just said when we were talking about that post earlier. I knew that something was weird in evangelicalism, right? Just like a lot of people have said, I knew something was weird a few years ago when all these pastors started to lack clarity all of a sudden. Um, but I didn't know what it was, right? I didn't know what it was, and I found myself very often confused. Okay, and I mean, I can't, I can't say that, like, um, you know, I've, I've started to recognize a couple of weak spots in my theology now. Like, I need to, un I need to develop a better understanding, a theological understanding of, um, of, of immigration. Okay, I know immigration is wrong. I know that, uh, I know that as a country, we cannot continue to do the things that we're doing. I know that all illegal immigration needs to be stopped. I know that mass deportations need to happen. And I know that because of some, some Bible verses that talk about it, but specifically because I'm leaning on the wisdom of older, wiser Christian men who have said that that's the case. And I trust that they've studied the Bible. Okay. So that's one example of like, that's a place where I know that I need to be stronger and more fortified so that if someone gets up and says something wrong, I can say that's wrong. And I know why. Okay. So I, I hope that as Christians, we can learn to be intentional about following the Lord and not be passive. And then that can help us to guard against uh, a guy like J.D. Greer um, saying something um, that could be confusing. All right? Well, I hope you guys have a great week. Um, and I hope that this is something that we can just apply and take away and dig into God's Word. All right? We'll see you next time.